most people everyone's Everybody. actually in attendance so um you know, you're all very welcome obviously I can advise you all to maintain social distancing throughout the meeting um, the this morning we'll consider a briefing from the Department for Infrastructure in relation to the monitoring round. We have no apologies. Um, moving on to Chair's business item two. Um, the member agreed to send a copy of the departmental response dated the 27th of May 2020. Um, this is um, the committee raised questions sort of following our CBI infrastructure working group WebEx. Um, so if you're happy enough to send that through to CBI just for their information. Mm -hmm. Great. To do that. Okay, thank you. Moving then to draft minutes at item eight, which is page six. The draft minutes of the meeting of the third of June, twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. Members content to agree. Great. Great. Okay. Matters arising at page twelve. Matters arising from the meeting of the third of June. Um, are there any issues that members wish to discuss or have issues with in relation to that meeting? Okay. At, pa yeah, at, at page 15, there is a table in relation to outstanding correspondence, which um, the committee have issued and are awaiting reply. Um, this will be a working document and added to as correspondence is issued and entries will be deleted as replies are received. Obviously, we've been sending quite an, a number of letters in the last few weeks, and I think it's probably useful just for members just to keep Mm, it's um, very helpful. On top of that, yeah. just to, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. to yeah. we can refer to it, and if mm -hmm. we feel that it's gone on too long, that we can maybe ask for a yeah. um, send a little sort of gentle reminder, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, to move know. things on. So, if you're content that we do that, great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Moving then to um, item five, which is the departmental briefing for the June monitoring. Um, there have there been a range of, of briefings papers which have. Um, have come in relation to this um, item, and you'll also um, be aware that the minister uh, issued a statement this morning, just in relation to the budget. Um, we may want to consider whether we want the minister to come at some stage, just in relation to that. But we may want to discuss that at the end of the briefing. So Hansard will be recording. Um, as per normal, and we will welcome um, Mr. John McGrath, who's the Deputy Secretary of Transport and Resources, Ms. Julie Thompson, who's the Deputy Secretary of Planning, Water and DBA, and Mr. Andrew Murray, who's the Deputy Secretary of Roads and Rivers. So you're all very welcome. Um, thank you very much for attending um, committee today. Obviously, we didn't. We had scheduled you for last week, but I understand that there were um, some outstanding issues which still needed to be um, finalised, um, and hence then the papers then they arrived with us um, just in the last um, couple of days. So, if you'd like to make a statement, I'm not really sure who I'm going to look to. I'm going to look to John I, I'll open, sure. to make the statement, and then we'll follow up with some questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, we are glad to be here. Like some of us are glad to be anywhere at the moment, rather than sitting in front of a screen. So, <laughs> um, to talk about June monitoring and uh, reprioritisation, we forward details to the committee earlier in the week. Um, I should note also that the minister has made a statement this morning, a written statement on the overall DFI budget, a way of setting context. Um, just as background, I think it's important to note that this is probably the most uncertain, volatile context for financial planning and government in living memory. COVID and the lockdown, with the subsequent collapse of demand, has impacted greatly on public finances, and DFI is not immune from that. To set the context for doing monitoring and reprioritisation, I should explain that the resource budget available to the Minister has meant that NI Water has a resource budget short of its minimum requirement, and that is touched upon in June monitoring. There remains a shortfall in Translink's baseline budget, which will require a remedy in the 21-22 budget process. The road maintenance budget, again, falls short of what is required, as highlighted in the Barton report and subsequent NIAO report. And the insufficient funds are at this stage, can't at this stage be set aside for winter service. On capital, the open budget fell short of the needs which we had originally identified, which was up to eight hundred million. But the impact of COVID has meant that all expectations here have had to be reviewed and revised. As indicated in her statement this morning, the Minister plans to spend some £544 million this year, 
which will make a significant contribution to economic recovery post-COVID. <coughs> Looking first at reprioritisation, you'll be aware that due to the COVID cost pressures on the system as a whole, the Finance Minister commissioned a reprioritisation exercise to hopefully free up funds to offset the COVID pressures. As your briefing indicates, the Minister commissioned a rigorous examination of the resource budget, but for the reasons I highlighted earlier, she has concluded there is no scope to find savings in that budget this year. She did, however, critically review the COVID-19 bids and has identified the means to reduce these by some £18 million. Pounds. The detail of this is in your briefing. Given the scale of the COVID pressures, this is a significant adjustment. On capital, the Minister has still faced difficult decisions in terms of priority and allocating the £544 million and has concluded that there is no scope for surrender. Moving on then to June monitoring. We have submitted resource bids of 21.6 million as detailed in the briefing, and as always, we are happy to talk to those. On capital, we are surrendering 14.5 million on flagship projects because the now anticipated spend 2021 is less than that was, which was factored into the budget settlement. And because these are flagships, we are required to surrender this um, underspend. Because of the overall uncertainty about how quickly construction picks up, the Minister has, however, concluded that an intended spend of £544 million is prudent and does not propose to bid for any more capital in this round. That is where I would like to conclude the opening remarks, Chair, and we are, as always, happy to pick up any issue of you and members have. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, do, does anyone else wish to make any comments at this stage? No? Okay, thank you. Just, I mean, obviously, given the massive pressures that we now see right across um, all the service areas, and as a consequence of COVID, and, and I know that you've you've um, talked about the reprioritisation exercise and so on, but are you satisfied that everything was done by the department um, during the COVID period to ensure that budgetary controls were put in place? And I'm I'm sort of mindful of that in relation to to TransLink and also to DVA, given the fact that obviously the instruction or the advice perhaps given was about looking towards business continuity planning, particularly for TransLink, while at the same time the message was being given for people not to use public transport. And then we also have a similar situation then with DVA, where they've been offering a very limited service back as far as January with, in relation to the issues around lifts. So, Bearing in mind those two aspects of it, are you satisfied that everything was done? I, um, Julie will talk about DVA. No doubt. Um, I think, as a general point, I think we would be um, satisfied that, in terms of our controls of expenditure and that of our arms and bodies, those remain in place and rigorous. Um, but what has happened as a result of COVID is essentially you know, demand has collapsed, whether or in DBS case, unable to provide services which generate fees. Therefore, you know the, the cost control side. I see no reason to assume anything has gone awry there. It's the income side that has collapsed, for obvious reasons. That we talk about that, um, but at the same time, we we still have to pay staff, run services, make things available, which meant there's been there's been minimal scope to make savings on that side. I mean, we are I would say since we've had difficult resource budgets since. 2015 or so, we are in the business of always checking our controls and monitoring. So I'd be quite happy to affirm that we're satisfied that our cost control remain rigorous. As I said, it's the demand side in terms of income, which has fallen, whether it's in Transnic, it's in DVA, or indeed in parking enforcement, where the Minister has a, has a commitment to tackling COVID, reduce sort of parking enforcement from very early times. Julie might want to add on DVA. I'm not happy to confirm that for DVA as well. Um, the, the simple fact of the matter is that the income has dropped um, and the cost base is, is pretty much fixed. And therefore, you are left in a situation where you have a gap. Now, we've obviously been refining that gap and looking at it, and that's part of DVA is a significant part of, of the contribution towards um, reducing our, our original uh, pressures assessed. But other than that, we can absolutely confirm that we have looked at the costs, we've looked at the budgets and um, we are doing things you know as efficiently and as effectively as we possibly can. It's a simple fact that we have lost 
the income that is driving the problem in both of the organisations. Uh, there's been an, an ongoing conversation in relation to um, furloughing of staff, um, which I suppose came sort of laterally um, through this process. And there was a bit of toing and froing between um, the infrastructure minister and obviously the finance minister as to who and where responsibility lay with regard to that. And obviously we're at sort of the last day with regards to furloughing staff. Um, at the, the end of last week, we always got, we got sort of wind of the fact that a small number of Ulster bus um, staff and Ulster bus tours were going to be um, furloughed. Um, were there no opportunities at an earlier stage to um, to consider furloughing staff rather than laterally? Well, we have looked at the scope for furlough staff and particularly looked at it again recently in the light of the further guidance that came out from the finance minister and uh, both the accounting officer in the NIW and indeed in DVA and um, Transink have been asked to give their own formal assessment and assurances to the permanent secretary that they're well, about what scope there is for um, accessing fur um, furlough. And again, the conclusion has been there is no scope. Um, in Translink's case, because the buses have low demand, although it's picking up now, it, it doesn't mean that costs have reduced at all. Um, and they're now doing a lot of work to prepare to, uh, for whatever increase in passenger numbers, which is very evident, which in terms of the work and to make stations and all safe, as much staff as would be redeployed to deal with that. So, to ensure that there is a public transport system ready to cope with recovery, there is no scope to put staff onto furlough. And the same judgment has been made in terms of NI water. There is no reduction in demand for water. In fact, there is an increase in pressures in terms of the impact of the prolonged good weather. It's had. So, furlough implies you, you have staff who could otherwise be made redundant. That is not the case. As you, as you are clearly were. Sure, there is an issue about Ulster bus tours, which is a small commercial offshoot of Translink, which business has disappeared, and we're currently aiming to progress uh, those staff into furlough. Okay. Um, in, in the paper, and we've, we've heard this now being discussed now over the last number of weeks, weeks is in relation to the um, the money which is being held centrally um, for transport pressures. Um, and you referred to that in your document where you're saying a remaining amount of some 59.5 million is earmarked for transport pressures by the executive and the minister has also obtained an assurance that TransLink will be sustained. Yet we've received um, correspondence from the finance minister and he was very clear in his um, responses in the chamber as well. He says, in my statement to the Assembly on the 19th of May, I explained that the 59.5 million of the funding set aside by the executive for the transport sector has not yet been allocated. It is possible for departments, including the Department for Trans Infrastructure, to bring forward bids for this. It is also possible for the executive to decide to allocate some or all of it to another area. However, I would like to give every opportunity for transport bids to be submitted before other uses are considered. So there's there's no clarity in relation to that, or there's certainly no assurance in that that, that money will come to the Department of Infrastructure. Um, I think that's a, um, a view my minister would share, which has exercised her. I mean, we have um, lowered bids and updated the bids, particularly around Translink and DVA and NIW. Um, in terms of Translink, we have an open book with DOF colleagues. We share with them the cash projections, for, cash flow projections with Translink <coughs> on a very open door basis. Um, we have not received any queries around that information. So, in our view, the Minister's view, she has submitted her bid. It's fairly clear the factors behind it. Um, there is no scope to reduce those bids. It basically is people are not taking up public transport, but, but if they want it to be there uh, as we go through recovery, um, those bids will have to be met. In the same way, government has put up 1.6 billion for transport for London recently, and has put hundreds of millions into bus services around the country and rail services. <coughs> um, so the minister is of the view that she needs the funding to stabilise Translink this year, because clearly. At a certain point, if it does not have sufficient cash, it could run into liquidity issues, as we have discussed previously. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, I mean, it is important to recognise the executive has made available $30 million off late from that funding, which is pushed down. That will be going to Translink shortly. 
by the autumn, it's likely that there will be another gap in their cash flow projections, which will need to be filled. And there are issues of um, being raised in that organisation, indeed others, uh, about uh, auditors' concerns around the going, going concern issue. And these are real critical issues. I mean, uh, the Finance Minister obviously goes on and asks that the, the Infrastructure Minister provide a, a full picture of the pressures across all aspects of the transport sector. I, I thought that that had been made pretty clear. Um, and so does, my, so does my Minister. We have at length, and as I say, we have not received any queries on any <coughs> of our bids, COVID bids whatsoever. And at what point will that money be allocated? Have you been given any information from Finance in relation to that? No. you. In quoting the Finance Minister, you know as much as we do, Chair. It has got a transport label against it, um, and you know, that funding, that, that pot would also be needed to pay the executive's contribution to the airport package and to the ferries package, um, both of which are time limited and at this point in time may need to be extended or may need <coughs> some executive contribution. Um, so it's not necessarily clear to us that even that amount of money is earmarked for Transink. Yeah, and clearly, it's not, it's not enough, even if it is. Well, the committee have also raised concerns in relation to support for taxis and to hauliers. And again, if there were a package, you would imagine that that, that again that may come from that central pot for transport. If, well, if there were, and I know the issue around taxis has been subject of debate, and indeed the issue around freight. As a, an area where we and other departments did some work, I, it's a reasonable assumption that somebody might say that they would be candidates for the transport package, for the transport funding. Can I just ask um, Julie, just in relation to resumption of MOTs, when that is likely to happen, and also for an update on MOT lift installation? Yeah. So, in terms of the resumption of services issue. Um, and I guess you could probably pose that question about quite a few of the DVA services and, and maybe just to be helpful to members who maybe might want to ask about different services. The process we're going through is looking at each service and obviously considering what can be done to bring it back into uh, play. Um, in doing that, each service has to be looked at about what it actually requires, the social distancing, the PPE that might be needed, and, and actually risk assess the process in line with both MICS procedures, health and safety executive advice, uh, P -P PHA advice around all of those. And that process is ongoing at the moment. Um, around all of our services, um, and some of them, I guess, will be more straightforward than others to um, make uh, bring back into service. But none of this is easy. Um, once we even have a risk assessment process, we obviously then need to engage with. And very important that we engage with staff and trade unions about that process and ensure that they are happy. Uh, we also then have to bear in mind the customer angle, and a lot of these services are frontline, and MOTs obviously comes into that uh, in, in terms of making sure that the customers are maintained safely as well. Um, so all of that process is ongoing. The services are closed until the 22nd of June, and the expectation is that Minister would be providing an update on the services um, in advance of the 22nd of June. So um, I won't be able to give out any specifics on dates or anything today, but um, within a short period of time, we'll be able to make clear sort of the direction of travel around DVA services. And an update in relation to the installation of the lifts? Installations of the lifts is ongoing, is going well. Um, we have, uh, by the end of this week, I think we will have 10 centres uh, up uh, with the lifts installed in them, leaving five still to be uh, put in place. So those are basically running and being put in as was originally intended despite the COVID pandemic. Now there's obviously then the issue around the Belfast and Yutnards uh, MOT centres, both of which are being used um, for COVID-19 testing. And the, and the latest understanding from the health services that they still require those uh, test centres for COVID-19. And our minister has been very clear that she wishes to support the health and social care sector in doing so. Um, so we are obviously looking at that and, and understanding it, but we won't be able to put lifts into Belfast and Newtonards until um, the COVID-19 <coughs> testing work has, has been completed. Okay, and do we have an idea when on-street parking charges and enforcement will be resumed? I can uh, answer that question, Chair. Um, like, like many services, this is one which is easier to stop than it is to start again. 
but we are recognising that there are considerable pressures to start. Traffic volumes have gone up. There's a lot of parking <coughs> in uh, tourist spots and, and town and city centres. Uh, we're, we're working now on uh, a paper which will be presented to the Minister. Uh, that paper will uh, have a number of recommendations in it. In, in relation to whether we, what, what sort of advanced publicity we have, whether we have a, a warning period, which we would normally do when you reintroduce parking, whether it will apply to moving traffic offences or just parking offences. Um, uh, so there, there's, a, there's a series of steps to go through. Uh, I, I would, however, expect that within a few weeks parking enforcement will be resumed. Okay, because looking at the paper, there's 1.5 million reasons for to resume it. Uh, absolutely, and. and we, we, we have to balance the fact that we are encouraging people not to use public transport to overload that system, uh, but we are also encouraging people to return to work. So there, there are balances to be made there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thank you, Chair, yeah. and you're welcome back, John. Uh, the last day you were before us, you, you portrayed an image that the department had in two cow runions to rub together, and now, now we're in a situation where we're handing money back, which is, is slightly concerning. Um, but just want to pick up on a couple of points and come back to the certainly the forlooming issue because it says in your briefing um, that the department engaged with the updated guidance. Yep. Uh, in terms of the original guidance, what line did that take? Was there engagement in the the original guidance? Or? Oh yes, we've engaged with this throughout because obviously if there was potential to um, furlough significant numbers of staff and still maintain the services that were needed. It could have helped reduce the COVID bid, so we have engaged with this throughout. Um, we engaged again when new guidance came out, as we were asked, um, and with respect to particularly since it was clear about the redundancy issue, that's how, for example, the Ulster Bus Tour staff became more into the frame, um, because basically the, the, that worked, it's a virtual operation. It's nothing to do now. The staff have nothing to do, and in fact, you know, Almost certainly, there would be redundancies if um, furlough wasn't possible. But we have looked critically at this. Um, there just seems to be a misunderstanding that because Translink have had to be run, but essentially a lot of empty buses, though some routes were never got empty, they still have to maintain the fleet, pay staff, <coughs> all of that, and then be poised to support recovery. Um, and already we have issues of demand rising of some bus routes. Already, and, and another issue in terms of transit is the school transport service that they provide to the EA. And already, there's discussions going on about what that would mean <coughs> in terms of Minister Weir's ambitions to come back. And indeed, the two ministers met on Monday to discuss that. So, and I mean, transit will be critical to that. Um, although there will be real issues about how many children can actually be moved with social distancing. So the, the, the view that somehow there's a lot of staff sitting around with nothing to do and therefore could be furloughed um, or potentially made redundant, I think, is you know, it's a misunderstanding. And it, that's the same, Julie, really can talk about NIW. We've looked at these issues, but the, when, we, when we come out of recovery, people will still expect public transport to be there. They'll still expect water to come out of the taps. They'll still expect, you know, the roads to be maintained. You know, we've had to keep running services, so we don't see um, how, the, even after the bigger <coughs> assessment, and it's been done, as they say, the latter one has been done with personal assurances from the accounting officers to the principal accounting officer, who will be reporting to the minister. We're satisfied. We've tested all our, the scope for this, and satisfied ourselves that, in terms of the guidance and the need to maintain critical public services, there is minimal scope to furlough staff. And, and John, and I don't think that was the concept. The, the, the primary aim was to look across each department to see how you address pressures, and they asked the question in that context, be it furloughing or anything but, else. But, as I, as I said, but there seems no. to be at some a view that there's a lot of staff sitting around with nothing to do, and we should just furlough them. That's, no. that's not, and, and that's not, that's not the question I'm asking. Okay. I'm just, I'm just saying every department were looking across the board yes. and trying to address pressures right across. Yep. It's not picking on one name. Or, that's all. I was only asking. But, but just let's go on to the allocation of funds and the potential allocation of funds um, being redressed across to address COVID pressures. And we did ask this question before, and it said that no allocations either couldn't be made or wasn't needed. But now we hear that there was a DVA trading fund. Could, they have been, could that have been used, or, or could you cross-tie well, it? Well, Julie picked it up. I mean, yeah. 
Did it always is a DVA trading fund? Yeah, and we've looked oh. at the, the DVA trading fund and what is possible to be funded from that, and hence the suggestion about looking at the high bank project and funding that from the DFI capital budget. So it's been looked at in the round across all of the, the area and to say, if we take that money from the capital budget, and that's then opportunity cost, if you like, and that's something in the main capital budget, then will not will not happen that would otherwise potentially have been funded. It provides enough cash, effectively, to allow a part of the DVA shortfall to be funded, but there's still a gap of £14 million there that is not addressed through doing that, which would need to be coming from the centre. We also have to make sure that the DVA is supposed to break even one year with another, and this gets a little bit complicated, but we have to keep an eye on what is happening at that level too, and that it can break even one year with another, and we can't over-push that too far. So with a 24 million assessed gap um, on DBA, there's no way that that organisation can take that. It's just it's far too big uh, for an organisation of DBA size. And hence, what we're suggesting, what the minister is suggesting, is that we bring uh, effectively the 10 million of Hyde Bank uh, funding from the centre into DBA, which would otherwise have been funded from the reserves. We've talked about the reserves before quite a lot actually here in the context of the lifts um, and, and, and all of that. So we know the reserves are, have purposes to which they were to be assigned. So all you can do with the reserves is say, well, I was originally going to use them in this particular way and they were going to be used for Hyde Bank. But if the departmental capital budget funds that instead, then that allows an element of DBA uh, gap to be funded in that way. But there's still a gap of £14 million there. The furloughing option on DBA has been looked at. The Finance Minister has also in, uh, concluded and indicated that it would be difficult, difficult to see how it would be applicable to DBA. So we, we're all on the one page as far as that is concerned. Those skilled mechanics and examiners are needed uh, and will be needed, and, and hopefully in the not too distant future, as services resume, will be brought back into play again. So we, we are, I guess, on DVA, where, where we are at is that we can, uh, through impact on the DFI capital budget, take some of the pressure off, thereby giving some assistance to the overall picture. But we don't have the capacity to deal with it all, and we need the other 14 million then, which has been logged into DOF, to um, to manage that pressure. No, and I appreciate it. It just it seems to come across that it's, it's us against you. Or what we're saying is, you know, we we would support the department in being creative to try and address mm -hmm. the issues right across the board. That's the point I'm making. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we we'll, we'll go back to the monies that are the the 55 million. If there's a bid put forward, I don't think any of the committee members wouldn't have an issue. In support and be it for taxes or whatever. That's all we're saying. And it's just we don't want to create the impression that that's not the case. But it's just some of the some of the stuff was in the in the briefing. Just finally in relation to resource bids, the resource bids is lower than the outstanding resource pressures previously identified. Could the department comment on how success how successful the department has been with the bids in the past of this? Well the the, the resource bids essentially reflect um, some of them are issues that weren't covered in the uh, in the opening budget settlement. I mean, members of some would be familiar that the road maintenance budget has been um, at an inadequate level since 2015-16, um, and every year it features in our bids, and sadly every year we do not get sufficient to bring it back to a sensible level, um, and simply for winter service. Um, these items are recurring every year, and if we don't get them in the, or the baseline budget, we, we tend to bring them forward in um, monitoring rounds. Um, the other bids, and I don't know why you want to go into the detail of them, reflect the current pressures that we do have at the minute. Um, but I would stress these bids, as really any budget I'm familiar with in, in DFI or formerly DRD, are just to get us back to running. An adequate service. There's no element of expansion or super development here. It's just to get back. I mean, members and Andrew can talk about or can see the deterioration of the road network because the road maintenance budget um, has been at a lower level for five, six years now. Um, we're just we're almost bidding for basics here. Okay, and if you can follow up to the committee with any figures you want to. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hildage. Thanks, Mr. Yeah. I suppose. That's been covered already. 
<coughs> which I would have them. Uh, in relation to the minister came in and she made a great sort of play and I agreed with her at the start in relation to bread and butter issues which the public would see out there as an immediate improvement to the, with the roads maintenance and particularly the street lighting and that. Has, has there been any in roads moving into that since last year? Um, Andrew can talk about the detail clearly in terms of the the resource road maintenance budget. Um, We'll be able to do a bit more than perhaps we did last year, and Andrew can talk about that. Um, in the capital decisions the Minister has taken, um, and has announced, she will be able to maintain the investment in terms of structural maintenance and street lighting. But Andrew, much better place to talk about that. Okay, yes, uh, we're actually starting on the road maintenance side in a slightly better position than we were last year. As far as capital is concerned for resurfacing and surface dressing, we are starting with the same amount of money as we had last year, and with the COVID situation, that might be as much as we could, we could spend, so we are happy enough with, with that. It is not as much as the structural maintenance funding plan, clearly, but it is the same as last year, and it will keep the industry going and it will help the recovery. On the resource side, which is used for patching and street lighting repairs and things like winter service, we are slightly better than last year in that we have enough money to keep fixing streetlights for the full year. Last year, uh, as you might remember, we did not have enough to carry that budget right through to the full year, and there was a period we were not fixing streetlights. Uh, that hopefully we have enough money to keep us going on streetlights this year. Uh, patching will be at a similar level to last year, and basically we will be providing the limited maintenance service that we have been providing since 1516, uh, with, with the money that we already have. We, we have a bid in uh, for two elements of additional funding, and that bid would allow us to carry out a full programme of winter service. We have currently only got £3 billion in the budget for winter service, which would not take us through even a mild winter. And we have an £11 million, uh, 11 million pound bid in to, to bring maintenance services out of the limited service up to uh, what we would regard as a, a more best practice maintenance service. Thank you. And on the capital schemes, John, I believe potentially that there was money given up, surrendered. Is that right? Yeah, because um, when the budget was set, it had estimates of, of expenditure on the flagship projects, um, and now the estimate of spend on two of the projects is less, for obvious reasons, with the slowdown. Um, therefore, the spend this year will be less. We are required to surrender any. Uh, underspend or a lower estimate on flagship projects to the centre. That's the way. So we have no choice about that. Yeah, there is no guarantee that comes back. Is that correct? Is that well, that's uh, norm correct. normally, yeah. when we surrender from flagships, we would have other bids that we would like the money back for. The minister's judgment at this point in time is that she's endeavouring to spend 544 million for the rest of the financial year. Uh, you have an uncertain context with the construction industry in, in different areas picking up or whatever. Um, there is still a lot of uncertainty in the industry. There is a view that um, work will go slower than originally estimated and will probably in some areas cost more because it, the cost of social distancing measures will be passed on. So I think the Ministry's view is that spending £544 million in this year would be a good achievement. Bidding for more now would be perhaps looking for money that we couldn't necessarily get spent. I mean, there's a lot. Um, we're endeavouring to the Minister's programme capital to make a big contribution to economic recovery, uh, to get some transport water, public transport priority dealt with. Um, we've got about 40 per cent of the capital block. Uh, you know, we're, 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 it's a big ask to try and get this done. Um, and we would be monitoring our capital spend very closely this year to see just see what the actual trajectory is because and as Andrew and others know nobody really is quite certain how quickly the industry will pick up. Therefore we think it wouldn't necessarily be prudent to be bidding for more money now. Well, not entirely clear. It's a it's not typical of us because we normally have, you know, more demands and there's money. This year is different as I said earlier. Uh, we've had a response from the Minister in relation to the situation facing the taxi industry. 
Uh, obviously, this has been battled about for some time now at the committee and between the department and the minister. Uh, the Minister of Finance is very clear that there, there hasn't been any bids made either by infrastructure or the economy in relation to trying to give some assistance <coughs> to the taxi industry. But where, where has that been sitting or why has it been taking so long to come to the fore or has any work been done at all in relation to the um, payments to the taxi industry? Well, um, I'm dead. There has been a lot of uh, discussion around the taxi industry in government and without. Um, the Minister's position is very clear that uh, we have a responsibility for regulation of the t t taxi industry. Um, that does not extend to uh, um, having a role in terms of providing financial assistance, nor do we have the barriers to do that. And therefore, if there was to be any financial assistance, there it would be through the Department for the Economy, which is responsible for a number of the current schemes to deal with COVID. Um, and I have no doubt if we get in touch with the Department of the Commonwealth or the Telegraph and contact the Department of Justice. Well, no, I don't, I, I don't, it just I, seems to keep going. I don't, well, uh, we're very clear. I mean, we have responsibility for regulation. It doesn't extend to that, and we don't have the barriers even to make payments. The Minister has been consistent on that the whole way through. Um, now, I know there is still a lot of public debate, and uh, in the industry itself, there might be a view that there should be a package. But the Minister of uh, Finance is clear that the Department has not received any bids. For support for the taxi industry, and nor so that's and, and expecting them to come from somewhere. Well, as the chair indicated, you know there there is a finite pot of money at the centre with transport labelling in it, and already we've got worthy bids in excess of that. So, I mean, if there was to be a package for taxis, that might be seen as another candidate for it. So, well, um, the bid in John, the Department of Finance potentially maybe the monies that are sitting are. Monies are being used to offset the cost of COVID. Could, could that maybe be used? Or well, I think I, I think if you believe, I mean the reprioritisation exercise is based on the premise that the COVID monies at the centre are not sufficient. There simply isn't enough money to cover the pressures at the minute, and that there may well be other pressures. So, not every possible need can be met, and that's why you know, and as I say. My minister has a view. She's not has no responsibility for financing of the taxi industry. It's a, you know, it's a business um, as such. It might look to the part of the economy, but equally, not every sector. There's not an aid package for every sector at the minute. Chair referred to earlier a lot of work was done, for example, at by ourselves and nationally around the whole freight industry. And the conclusion was that there should not be a package. That there may be impact on the sector, but um, so there was a decision. Taken. Was no well, there was a lot of work done about uh, about freight, um, about na at national level, and the conclusion was that there shouldn't be a package. Of course, we'll see perhaps see the outworkings of that in the, in the coming months with regards to hauliers and the impact that it really has had. Uh, Sorry, Chair, Mr. Boylan, no, wants to come in on that just point. A, just a wee quick point, Chair, because. Just to make it clear, I am sure the committee would support any of the groups out there that put a proposal forward or support during the COVID. So we are not singling out anybody. But John, let us go back to the regulatory issue, because there was support from a number of ministers across the board in terms of ferries and in terms of haulage. And you are saying now, because the taxis is a regulatory issue, and I think that is totally wrong. And I think if there was a proposal put forward, most of the people in this committee would certainly support the department in doing that. So I can't see why there was support for the haulage industry and support for the ferries, in, which there was, even if it was only a lot of support. Mm. So all I'm saying is, we, we would support that. So it's like Mr. Hildes is saying, no point running away from it. So we are not making a political issue collectively around this table, oh, no, I, around I, this room. I, I, I think, and that's the point we're saying. Because you know you are taking the licence fees and everything else as a regulatory body, and still not when they need support, there is no support, and it doesn't stack up. To be honest with you. Well, just just to be clear, um, there is no package for the whole age industry. That's the but, point. But there is, but there was support from the ministers. Both there, there was an, there was analysis of that. Well, we'll soon see um, what, whether there is going to be a package or not. The package around ferries was essentially to maintain um, supply chains. If food, you know, with ferry right. it disappeared, food wouldn't get here. John, I think we're clutching the straws. The point is, there was support. That's all I'm saying to you. Oh, I, I agree, Cal. There's support. Yes. My minister, and, and we would support. It's not her responsibility. 
to argue or to try to put in place a financial support package for the taxi industry. Okay, Mr. Tilda, did you want to come back on that point? No, no, it's fine. There are a few other, but I'm moving on. That others get it. Okay. But very, it, was just, it was just on that particular point. I mean, uh, if we were all going to campaign for the hairdressers, the beauty salons, the you know, but can, can I just confirm uh, with with um, officials that in relation to the taxi industry per se, uh, can, can we get an idea? Maybe uh, later we could write to the fine or to, to whomever uh, around the schemes that are available. There, there is the self-employed scheme. There's the Treasury have some schemes and the Department of Communities around uh, some of their help that's available and um, um, the finance. And I understand that uh, the Economy Minister uh, met recently with uh, Minister Malin in terms of her, uh, the Minister for the Economy, in coming forward with particular schemes. But the taxi industry isn't alone as being a, a discrete group or business that needs support but they're not excluded from those other generic pools of assistance. Would that be right? I, in, in principle, yes, you're right. I mean, it would, they may well be able to access some of those national schemes, but obviously we have no knowledge of that at all. Okay. But like for self-employed and the rest, they, they could access, presumably if they met the qualifications, but we're completely unsighted on that. Okay, thank you. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and for the record, I've declared a an employee of Clans Link and a member of um, Ards and North Down um, Borough Council. Um, just a couple of things, maybe touching upon the taxi stuff that's just been discussed. Um, I have a question into the Minister of the Economy about what support she intends to provide to that industry. It's been outstanding for weeks now. It's very clear that the Department of Infrastructure doesn't have the varies to provide that support. That responsibility lies within the Department of the Economy. And the lack of any response. Um, says volumes really in relation to the issue, so I think we need to be clear where the responsibilities lie in relation to that. Um, just following up in relation to the parking enforcement thing, um, most retails are allowed to open from Friday if they have on-street access. And I know a number of traders have been in contact with real concerns that um, we're going to have a situation where a lot more people are going to be coming into town and city centres, but there won't be that enforcement of parking restrictions and the concerns around that, particularly around safety in terms of people parking in areas which are um, going to cause congestion and, um, and um, risks to pedestrians. So I think it's really important that that uh, work is progressed ASAP to make sure that we have that enforcement in place. I don't know if there's any time skills can be given in relation to that, but it's just a real concern for those uh, town centres. Um, the it, within the papers, it outlines the most pragmatic scenario in relation to the funding requirements for TransLink. I just wanted to get some clarity on what that most pragmatic scenario is, because I think that's of critical importance, the, the, the level of financial support that's going to be required um, to get TransLink through to the other side of this. So it's understanding what the, the most pragmatic scenario is. Um, and uh, just in relation to the DVA staff and the, uh, working at the MOT centres, I understand obviously there's been an, an agreement they can't be furloughed. So we have an interest in understanding what they're doing at the present moment in time, what, what's been happening over the last number of weeks in terms of the, those staff members. Uh, and the last question, because I'm conscious of time, is that th there's bids in, in relation to Brexit posts and Northern Ireland water Brexit preparations. Um, uh, we understand what happens if those bids aren't met and what the implications around that, because whilst we're dealing with the pandemic, we're also dealing with the risk of a no-deal Brexit, and it's important that those posts are funded. So what the implications would be if they're not funded? Well, I, 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 I deal with the transit pragmatic issue, and Julie will pick up on Brexit. Um, in trying to determine um, the scale of the problem transit we'd face in the year and, and the likely gap, um, they ran you know, two scenarios, which are basically how much patronage would return by the end of the year. Uh, one scenario was based by the end of the year you'd get back to 55 per cent on a sort of steady rise, and the other uh, more optimistic one was 75 per cent. And that's, that's why there was a, a range of bids went into that, because it's, it's essentially guessing. I mean, none of us know to what extent people will want to pick up public transport. The extent to which, with social distancing, if you keep two metres, you'd be able to accommodate them. Um, how much people will use cars in the meantime. So it, that was the two scenarios that were factored into the cash flow projections, um, all of which have, are updated 
to reflect the actual reality as things go on a, on a sort of monthly basis, on which we share with DOF colleagues, so they know it's an open book. These are our best guesses as to what the scale of the financial gap that Transnet will have, because obviously it's, it's the fall and patronage has caused it. So that's the base of pragmatic. And obviously, in the end, it will be what it will be. You know, we can't control, so that will get updated when we see some clear trajectory over the next few months. We might be, we will revisit those assumptions and see do they still stack up. But it's going to be really difficult because you're talking about you know 15 percent of capacity at best. So the, the real um, limit in this will be how long social distancing of two metres indeed or indeed what applies. Because then you won't be able, you, you won't have full capacity to fill. So uh, that's that's the assumption. And on anything like these, it's clear that the financial problem will go into 21-22. So it's not it's not just a this year issue because it, until you get back to anything like the level of patronage that we had, and there will still be a financial issue. I think, Julie. Um, okay, I, I'll yeah. pick up the, the next couple. I think. Parking enforcement. Um, so, on the DVA staff issue, um, obviously we have been looking to see about getting as many people working as possible, uh, and there's been a huge amount of effort has gone into getting people able to work remotely from home. And um, actually, credit to the, the, the IT folk have been absolutely amazing in helping uh, as many people as possible to do that. Now, that really affects a lot of then the, the people involved in licensing and that sort of thing, rather than obviously the, the test centre folk. Um, but there has been work that needs to have happened there. We obviously were working on getting TECs issued. We were looking at getting refunds issued and all of that. So there is other work that has had to have happened. Um, redeployment has been offered to staff where they are not able to work on the service in which they, and that's been across the board now. Unfortunately, the take up on that has not been that great, but um, we, that has been an offer, and people, if they want to, can, can take that up. Uh, and now, obviously, we're looking then at restoration of services and what that might look like as we move forward, and we'll have to bring people in and get them trained and, and understanding what the processes and the procedures are, and working with us to enable uh, services to be restored and helping that to happen. So it hasn't been an easy thing at all for DVA staff. Um, and I think, as, as Andrew said, bringing services back is also exceptionally challenging. So there's a lot of work actually goes on behind the scenes to try and make that happen. Um, and but to the furlough point, I mean, the, the, the Minister of Finance is agreeing that that DVA staff are not suitable for furlough. We need them to be able to be available to restore those services, um, and we will continue to work to enable that to happen. On the Brexit issue, uh, NIW have one of those beds, and the other bed then is in the department. Um, so. Um, as we look ahead to Brexit, uh, as was last year for the potential of no deal on, on NIW, um, it's an absolutely vital service. We must make sure we protect the supply chains. We must ensure that everything is done to ensure that chemicals and all equipment and all of that is, is in play for um, um, potentially around December time. We're working across the UK on that. Um, and there's, um, just like COVID, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty about what exactly will happen. Um, but it's hard to see that some extra resources are not needed in the same space um, for NIW to make absolutely sure that we can go through the winter time uh, and have enough capacity and ability to uh, ensure that our water service is protected, and that's what that bid is about. Um, I don't know whether you want to pick up the staff, the yeah, Brexit, the, staffing yeah, internal, the, and then the we'll Brexit get... post is essentially. All departments or most departments were given additional funding over the last couple of years to deal with the, the work pressures leading up to Brexit and, and against preparations for No Deal. Um, we got 1.3 million, which actually is quite small compared to some other departments. Um, that funding was not put in place again for this year. So we have a number of staff, all who are still needed, because the Brexit, you know, Brexit hasn't gone away at all, and will, you know, is looming up even as we speak in terms of work. So we have a cohort of staff, the funding for which we did not receive in the budget, um, unlike I think some other departments. So we're bidding for that because um, we still need those staff. We probably could do with more, but there might be a scope for that. And. Um, we face a heavy burden of Brexit work, which will probably the committee will see more of, particularly in terms of legislation as we go forward for the rest of this year. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just on the parking enforcement, it is useful to hear that view, and we will feed that into our process. We, ha we have gone very quickly from a situation where town centres were deserted to the current situation where there is quite a demand for parking. While the regulations have not been relaxed, people are aware that there is not enforcement at present, and there is irresponsible parking. So We will certainly be encouraging people, first of all, to park responsibly. We will then be probably issuing some sort of a warning ticket to those that are not parking uh, legally, and then we will move into foot enforcement. But the preparations are well in hand for that. Oh, that's appreciated because it is a concern, obviously, because things are changing very quickly. I would add that the department has been historically underfunded for years, so you are dealing with a very challenging situation. So you have my support in relation to that. It is a, it's a very small cake that you and I have that you have got to divide up. So I think it is important that that point is made. Yeah, thank you. And Julian, I am not sure I am particularly satisfied by your answer to Andrew in relation to what DVA staff were actually doing. And the fact that there was resistance from many to perhaps be redeployed, you know. So what were those staff doing? And I don't mean that to be cheeky in any way. I'm trying to be careful. careful. I'm trying to be careful. I was trying to be careful. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not entirely convinced by your answer. Well, I, I, sorry if I'm, I'm not being clear. Um, I mean, in terms of those staff, they so when when close down happened, there was a lot of staff right across the civil service who could not work. Um, and I guess if I distinguish between those that are office based and indeed the people that are supporting the administration around the test centres, initially they were not able to work. But through a lot of work that has gone on, we've been able to get them working and give them the IT and the equipment that they need to be able to work from home. So um, now some of the work, as you well know couldn't be done from home and we've had to bring people obviously then into the Coleraine office in particular to try and keep the, the licensing process going where that requires postal work and that um, numbers of staff going back to, Co to Coleraine and back into the office has been increasing over the time um, that this has all been happening. So we've got more and more people effectively doing the work that they, that they should be doing maybe not as efficiently as they would have otherwise been done, but we're dealing with that in the best way that we can. It does leave a rump of staff um, who are you know, test centre mechanics and exa examiners who are not able to work. Um, we've offered those people for uh, oppor redeployment opportunities, which they haven't taken up. Um, in terms of then the question about well, what will happen to them, they are now going to be looking at resumption of services and bringing those things back on board. But they don't fit the category for furloughing because we can't we can't make those guys redundant. We need them to return the service, and they therefore don't fit the category. And like others across the civil service, they are not able to work at this point in time, and that's the simple reality of it. However, we need to those staff will be vital as we resume our services over the next few weeks and months. And I appreciate that, that there will be a considerable number of people who will not have done any work during this period of time and will have been paid, which will be very, very difficult then to justify to uh, um, the outside world um, and certainly the, the private sector who have met with severe challenges. Um, and it will be very difficult to justify that. But no, thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Buchanan. <coughs> thank you, Chair, and thanks, John. Uh, <coughs> my question, Julia, relates to a Class Two theory test. Uh, you talked, you referred earlier about um, no tests up to twenty first, twenty second of June. Do you see a resumption of them? And then, on, as well as that, you've also indicated, or somebody's indicated to me here, that there's a critical worker can do a Class Two theory test. Do you know is that currently happening? Um, in terms of the theory tests, we have been looking at them. It's obviously it's a national initiative there, um, and they're looking at that on, on a UK-wide basis. We would hope to be able to get that up and running, but it does depend on the work going across on across the, the UK, and it's part of the, the discussions that I described to the chair around looking at all of the DBA services and establishing how they come back online. Um, in terms of specifically about whether we have been able to do um, any tests, I think we have done a few, um, but I wouldn't have the full facts with me on that. Um, with are me today. Are they online, but Julie? Are they online? Or are they in a, in a classroom setting? 
It's normally done in six test centres across uh, Northern Ireland, and people come to those test centres, and that's part of the issue. Obviously, then with social distancing and whatever, how do you get those up and running? But I know it's absolutely being looked at um, to enable it to happen and to bring it back online again. So that, that's a national model you're referring to. to it's done through a national model. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Next question, then, um, Andrew. It's a very soft question. It's regarding grass cutting. Do you, you've normally done that once, twice a year. Do you know a budget figure to do that in Northern Ireland per year, or one cut? Uh, uh, no, I don't have that figure to hand. It's a surprisingly small figure, actually, for one cut. Um, and, and we are able to do two cuts oh. this year. It will be done with our, mainly with our in-house resources. So the, we, we already have the staff. It's, uh, the, the, the budget hit is really on, on fuel um, and, and, and the plant. And has, has all budgets then been passed down to local districts now? Yes. Uh, the, the, road, the road maintenance yeah. budget has been set, and it's set at a level which will allow the limited service to continue, which in the case of grass cutting is two cuts per year in all areas, uh, and as necessary at sight lines. Now, that, that's less than the full service that we used to provide before the, the cuts that John referred to earlier. We used to cut urban areas five times, up to five times a year. And when did they get that budget, Andrew, recently, you know, the, the local districts? Is that the past two weeks, three weeks? Long ago? Oh, yes, the budget has very recently been set, but we're, we're, we are at the start of the grass cutting season and we're able to do that work. OK, and final question then on, on referring to taxis. Have you issued any guidance to taxi owners or drivers or operators in regard to how they operate? In, in what terms? From a, from a safety point of view, from a COVID issue? No, we haven't. There is guidance available from there was general public health guidance, and there would be guidance available from the um, health and safety executive. But none from the, your department? No, the minister's gave you was that it's not our role to be issued guidance on those issues to, to anybody. OK. Thank you. Anything further? Oh, that's me. OK, thank you, Mr Beggs. Pick up the previous point. Is there not guidance issued from um, Westminster, which is uh, applicable to the United you know, Kingdom, given recommended good practice for vehicle usage, whether it be um, taxis or any other vehicle? Well, the DFT issued a few weeks ago guidance on public transport and guidance to people using public transport. And um, we're doing some work at the minute on similar guidance. And within, What's wrong with that guidance? Within, within the executive. What's wrong with the guidance already out there? And why, why have you not referenced it? Because I understand that that has been usefully picked up by many companies already. Um, well, the DFT guidance, um, they were shared at the last minute with the other devolved administrations. They may have slightly different views on it. Um, we have guidance a long way towards finalisation. Um, uh, but to be honest, uh, as you've seen of recent days, the whole issue about face coverings on public transport has arisen, which would be relevant to it, and that is, uh, has been considered. And my minister's view is, you can't just look at that in isolation from wider issues. I mean, people expect rules about face coverings, public transport. You need to account of first of all the whole issue of um, transport. Between here and the south, you know, if you don't have the same consistent thing, if you, you know, different rules. Um, what do people do in general? Uh, what about the people for whom face coverings is not appropriate? Perhaps people for health reasons. Um, uh, so she has wants the issue to be considered in the round rather than just as a public transport but, but issue. The information that's out there about. Uh if there's a second person in a vehicle rework, it's, it's, the advice is the second person should be in the back and, if possible, leave the windows open. You can deep, uh, deep, uh, compartmentalise a vehicle, uh, separate uh, ventilation sources. So there are a number of advice out there. So I'm surprised you haven't referenced that. The one thing I have picked up on a couple of occasions is you seem to be still assessing risks and considering things. I'd like to go back to Deputy Secretary. Um, Julie Thompson, with regard to the DVA, where you said you're still accessing risks for reopening for, for MOTs. Uh, garages have been deemed to be uh, essential and they're, they're workers, key workers. And MOTs and garages have re remained open in the United Kingdom 
uh, in, in England, Scotland and Wales with safe distancing and appropriate precautions. So why are we different? Why uh, have public officials deemed that we cannot operate at all? And in fact, you haven't got everything in place so that they could reopen now? We're, the model, as you say, is completely different, um, and you know the, the the way in which an MOT centre operates here, where you are continually doing that type of test. A garage in England will be operating a range of functions, and it won't necessarily be doing an MOT type test all the time. So the two models are completely different. Um, I appreciate that we obviously need to, and we know that there is um, concern, particularly about certain vehicles. We, the TEC's process is working and is taking care of most vehicles um, in most categories and allowing people to remain on the road. So that, that um, process working is, is really helpful. However, we do understand obviously that there are some vehicles that that does not work for, and we need to particularly ensure we get those vehicles back quickest and prioritise those back when we come back. Um, so we're at the point whereby the uh, procedures are, are um, n n almost finalised in terms of uh, being looked at. We need to then engage with the unions around those procedures, make sure that staff are comfortable with them, make sure that tra the training is in place, make sure that we can deal with our customers properly and that they are maintained safely through all of that. It's not a straightforward piece of work. And if you think about the interaction of an MOT where you've got the customer, the car and, and the staff member, all of that has to be looked at. Um, we know that the capacity will be nothing like uh, what we currently are able to do. If you think again of an MOT centre which moves through very quickly and there's a lot of, of moving parts, if you like, going through it. Um, the difficulties around social distancing will, will slow that process down. Uh, we need to consider where the customer is and what the role of the staff members are and shift <coughs> systems and things like that. So there's a lot of complexity with it. Um, and I guess to, to your point, are we, are we wanting to bring um, our MOT centres back as quickly as we can and as safely as we can. And that's, that's where we're at at this point in time. And Minister will be providing an update on that in the next... Um, few days before the 22nd of June to let people know how we intend to, 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 to enable that to happen. And we will be focusing on those priority customers who are stuck at this point in time. Um, so maybe the likes of um, the first-time taxis, for example, and the, uh, the cars that haven't been MOT'd for 12 months. We will get the ones that are who ha cannot get a TEC into our centres first. Uh, so that they can get back out on the road and keep things moving. Uh, but it is, a, it is complicated to, to make all of these things happen, and um, we will do it as quickly as we possibly can, but as safely as we can. And we're at the point where um, there is more confidence in that process and then an engagement with the trade union side and then moving through. So that should move um, within the next few weeks. Would you accept that the perception of the public is that they have had to get on with it, and mechanics have had to work, and garages have had to deal with the public and fix things and put in quickly appropriate protection for public and uh, their employees, but public officials just seem to be slow and reluctant to get on with it. Well, that may be a perception, but I can assure you that public officials are not being slow about all of this at all. It's a completely different model, and we need to make sure that it, it works safely for staff okay. and for customers. Can I inquire about motorcycle t uh, driving tests? How many have occurred over this past uh, number of months, three or four months? We haven't been doing those, but again, they're one of the ones that we are very close to having. Can to you be explain able to what the risks are, given that there is no need for direct contact between the person taking the test and the examiner? The, those are being looked at. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm why, not. Why the I'm delay? Not, why the examiner. delay? Um, we are looking at that one, and we will bring that back as quickly and as safely as we can. And that's the point we're at. We are very close on that one to bringing that back. And you, you can, you know, we have, we've looked at so many things within DVA to move the position on. Um, there's been an incredible amount of work has gone on, uh, and I appreciate, and I, you know, I recognise that not everything is fixed, and that's the frustration and the, and the concern, and we understand that completely. Uh, we've brought IVA testing back in. Uh, we've got uh, extensions on licences. We've got extensions on TCs. There's been a, a, a plethora of means of trying to deal with this, and we are working very hard to get 
moving forward to get more and more of these services back in. The motorcycle testing will be one of those as well, where we think we can move that a lot quicker, obviously, than, than um, driver testing in general. But um, and we need to understand about obviously the social distancing and where the interactions come in, and making sure we can do it safely. Again, that particular example where. The, the examiner is not in the same vehicle, they're not on the vehicle, they can be a reasonable distance apart. They're, the public does not understand why public officials are, seem to be very slow and reluctant <coughs> to get back to a normal, normality in a safe manner, because surely that is an easy one that should have been opened up months ago. We're looking to bring that back on plan, as planned as quickly okay. as we can. Um, in terms of large goods vehicles, we're picking up from, from industry that they're concerned that uh, they do need ongoing uh, drivers, uh, and eventually this will start to hit uh, uh, key functions if there's a shortage of drivers. Um, so are you engaging with the industry to see how a safe model can be brought back? That may mean a decompartmentalised uh, uh, cab, some way to protect the examiner. So are you looking in detail with the industry how, and particularly for large good vehicles, can be, be uh, uh, driver licences can be brought back? We look at obviously um, all of the services and in terms of working with the industry there's obviously um, hook-ins with the department on an ongoing basis with um, the, the haulage industry um, and the freight industry. We have Doing driver tests is a challenging thing. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. Um, you're in close contact, very close contact. Um, you tend to be using a vehicle that belongs to an organisation, so there's multiple vehicles involved. Um, if you have PPE, you need to be able to have full line of sight and you need to be able to stop a vehicle in an emergency situation have access to the ability to do that if the learner driver or you know um, runs into difficulty. So um, are we looking at it? Yes. But is there a straightforward solution to it? No, at this point in time. We will, of course, continue to engage on it um, and need to continue to engage on it and try and find a way to make it happen. Um, but that driver testing in particular is probably the most challenging of all the services that DVA currently do. Um, and we expect that we will, you know, it's the same as the rollout across the economy in general whereby the more straightforward areas are brought, being brought on board before the more complicated areas. and The same will apply for DVA. Okay. Going on to the June monitoring um, bids, there's a bid for £2.3 million for Northern Ireland Water Brexit preparations. Now, I'm trying to get my head around what Northern Ireland Brexit preparations uh, are required today compared to what they may have been that have in place. Uh, uh, over a year ago when Brexit was ex expected. I'm assuming perhaps some chemical storage. What is the £2.3 million for? Yeah, it, it is for looking at what we need in order to protect that service, whether it be chemicals or equipment and protecting supply chains. Um, Has that not been established already? You know what you need? We are... Yeah, but we need to then be able to finance that and make sure that that funding exists in the, the, the 20, uh, 2021 year. So any funding that we received in 1920 is already gone. It's gone from the books. It was taken away from the budget. If you need it again, you have to ask for it again. It's not a, it's not a budget that stays there from one year to the next. Um, it's not, not still so, sitting you know, there? It's not still sitting there. It, it, it's a one-year funding stream for okay. Brexit, and therefore you need it back again. But, but, but if it's a one-year funding stream, they, they, they put the goods into the store. So presumably that's an asset that they that they have, and they can run them down, but surely they're normally replenishing their assets anyway? You're looking at that as well in terms of what is happening to the to the actual assets. You're looking at what contractors need to do. Some of it is um, potentially able to be funded from last year in that if it's still there, but we don't think at this point, and then IW doesn't think at this point, that that will be sufficient to address everything that need. Having said that, Brexit is an ex it's a bit like what I was saying to, to Mr Muir. It's an exceptionally... Um, unclear exactly what will be needed, but we we need to put that marker bid in at this point in time because none of us would want to see the water in a position where they, it cannot have a protected supply chain moving forward. Final question, Mary then. Um, in your, your briefing document, one comment I picked up, there's, there was no significant opportunities to reduce costs. Have any departments or any um, at length bodies made any savings by exercising some opportunities to re reduce costs? 
Has anybody reduced cost? Um, or does the public just have to bear it? No, to no significant extent, but we would, when we look at NI Water and Transinc, we think we're looking at two professional, competent organisations which have had to deal with pressures over the years and sweat out costs. And, and, and Julie would control, but NIW is also under the eye of the regulator in terms of set yeah. challenging efficiency targets. So it's, they're, they're not, there's no free runs here. Translink has had to cope with uh, budget deficits for a number of years. Within that, it's had to deal with um, good financial management in terms of hedging. They've had to cope with giving pay awards without getting any additional funding. We have run a rise over their costs and assets over the last two or three years in terms of efficiencies and have not found no material weaknesses, nor indeed have we had any challenge from DOF colleagues around this, because the, the translink and, and the deficit issue has been sort of around these tables for about three or four years. So um, we're satisfied that they're you know, efficient organisations, which doesn't mean that we don't keep asking them to look for issues and testing. Maybe just to add in terms of the NIW situation. So, NIW, for example, you know they have to achieve, as as John says, uh, efficiency savings every year. For this year, it's 1.5 million. They've achieved 65 million since 2007. That has to be still delivered. We all know that demand has increased, and the drought situation and the lack of of, of rain in recent uh, weeks and months has added to their problems in NIW. So if you're dealing with an organisation that has to already achieve significant efficiency savings, has to then deal with an increasing demand situation forced upon it because of both the COVID situation plus the lack of rain, we have people then putting inappropriate items down toilets and that is creating also difficulties in terms of um, what happens with wastewater and the, and the amount of work that NIW have to, to put in play there. And you face that same public sector organisation with a complete drop in income, which is of no fault of its own. Then that organisation is in an incredibly difficult position, uh, $31.6 million for COVID. If you think that we as an organisation fund that uh, NIW just over 100 million, 105 million, 31.6 million is an incredible amount of money for them to have to actually find and deal with, which they obviously can't. Um, and the, the picture for them when they have already to deliver those efficiency savings to get back to where you started um, is, is a very, very challenging one. They have looked, but it is a simple fact that their costs have increased and far outstrip the savings. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks um, to you all for coming here today. Um, I have just a couple of questions, I suppose, and I know other members have touched on this in relation to you. The Minister hasn't has just decided not to bid for additional capital um, due, you know, due to the current context. But will that mean then that there's no room to further invest in um, pro projects such as the wastewater infrastructure, which is a, a major project that I suppose is crucial? Um, right across the north. Um, can we have an update on the assessment of delivery capacity for capital projects to give us a, a better idea of that? Well, um, we spent considerable time since the start of April in talking to the three um, COPE centres of procurement expertise about um, the market and the reaction to it. Um, we began those discussions in the context of the guidance from government that there be, should, should be some flexibility with suppliers who might run into difficulties. Um, but we have also moved on to discussions about the readiness of the industry. So, and I, I, have a, I meet the three COPEs every, every week at the moment for sort of that sort of intelligence and on the market. Um, and that is where the sense that um, different bits of the construction, and you can talk, for example, about the whole sort of roadside, um, are reacting differently, but there's an emerging view that, as I said earlier, it will take longer to do certain type of work because you've got social distancing issues at that. It will cost more, and therefore a lot of work that was already tendered may have to, the cost may have to be revisited to build in costs that weren't there because the uh, firms will have to use health and safety plans that are consistent with public health guidance. There will be a cost to that. Um, so we are staying in very close contact and we are involved in, in those discussions as well, CPD, who are taking an overall look. So we think we are probably as informed on the industry um, as we can be at this stage, but obviously 
it will only be getting to gear up a bit, although we have continued to work, for example, in the A6 homes throughout this, and Andy can talk about that. So we're staying very close to it, um, but that's why no one will know exactly how much pace they'll be able to pick up as you go through the year, whether there's any relaxation. Um, the Minister's view is spending $544 million will be an achievement in itself, and I suspect it may well be better than some of the rest of the public sector. Because at least we're, we're off and running now, and to bid for more money, one could take money that we mightn't get spent, and another department could make use of. I know it's not what we would normally do, but I think these are dif different times. And if we were back in this committee in three months, then we bid for money we couldn't get it spent, and we were surrendering it, you would rightly be asking us questions on that. Okay, and I suppose it's not too often we're able to say be an achievement in spent money to get it spent. Um, just in relation, I know um, the previous member had touched on some of this in terms of safe travel guidance, and, and, and we had said there the Department of Transport have issued guidance. Is there any reason why this department can't, or can we look at it? Um, and that will include, you know, buses, trains, and also the taxi sector, um, because I think, in particular, for first-time taxis, we need to be ensuring that we're helping them to to start trading again. Um, so, you know, is that something that we can do? Well, we, as I said, we were we were working up gains broadly reflective of the gains that issued elsewhere in the UK. Um, I'd hope probably to be close to point of issue and subject to tears within the executive. The, the issue in recent days of face coverings in public transport and whether or not that should be commended or made mandatory is clearly a relevant issue, and that's still in um, discussion because obviously it's not. Science is not fully supportive that there, that there are real benefits from that. And then there's also a view that if people have face coverings, they may think it reduces their need to socially distance. And I um, mean, Translake has had to deal with difficult issues in the last few weeks in terms of people massing on stations and, and paying no attention to social distancing. So we, we would hope to get that guidance out uh, before too long. It's obviously it's an issue which I know. The executive was discussing this week about the face coverings issue, and it's relevant. Yeah. You would either have to be saying it's part of that guidance, or, or you're not doing it at all. Yeah. No, thanks. I, and I, I think mean, it, this this is a very it's a movable feast at the minute. A lot of these issues, it, it, you know, nothing is yeah. set. You know, it's only set. You know, it's only set for a day or two. Then something else happens. Yeah. And I suppose we do need to be consistent in our approach as well. So it is important we get it right when, when it is issued. Um, and Julie, just come back to the point around. Um, I know Mr. Beggs mentioned about motorcycle tests. Obviously, a huge one for us is driving tests, and uh, in in the normal um, sense, you know, are we moving closer to that? Is there guidance being uh, drawn up for driving instructors? Because, you know, it's not only is it impacting on driving instructors as a sector, but it, it's also impacting on the people who maybe need to be able to drive for their, their jobs. And we had, I suppose, issues throughout the pandemic about key worker driving tests and things like that. So it is a key area that we're, we would like to hopefully be moving towards um, as quickly as we can. Um, we're certainly looking at, at the driving test side of it and what it would mean and, and the, um, I, the, the, the huge range of challenges that, that there are. And, and I've, I've described to Mr Beggs what some of those are. In terms of the actual industry, um, it's a bit like the answer that, that, that John has, has given. Um, they need to look to you know, the, the public health guidance and to the health and safety executive guidance and ho about how to open safely. We, we regulate that business. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't employ those, uh, um, those yeah. people. So we will absolutely be looking at the testing side. Um, but I don't want to raise expectations there either because it is exceptionally challenging. Mm -hmm. We have been able to reopen for provisional licences. Um, so that was closed and is now back reopen again, um, which at least means that people maybe can get out with their, their families and, and be learning. And I know that doesn't deal with the industry point, but at least it's starting to, to, to open it up a bit. Um, and we will continue to see what we can do to get driver testing um, as quickly and as safely as possible. But you're obviously in a very confined area in a car for a particularly long length of time and needing to be able to interact in a way and yet still being able to move. So it's not, it's not a simple or straightforward one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And just my last question, I suppose, for yourself, Andrew, in terms of the on-street parking, <coughs> um, in relation to the paper that you are currently working on, 
whilst I appreciate that there is a need for for parking charges and all of that, and we we, we know that that is it's had a, a significant impact on the budget, I, I am very conscious of the impact sometimes. And I'm, I'm speaking, I suppose, from the experience in my own constituency where we've had quite a lot of lobbying from local business because of the impact of of parking enforcement and how it can nearly deter a business at times if it's not managed right. Um, is there any scope in terms of the recovery to look at? Either reducing the cost, of the, the the parking fees um, on street, or extending the time that the, that the fee covers. So, for example, it's um, I think it's 15p for 15 minutes in, in my own area. So even to, to extend that a bit to help businesses, as well as obviously I, I understand we have to reinstate that. So, is there anything to, anything being done to look at that? Well, as I, I mentioned, that there are some decisions that we need to face when we resume parking enforcement, and one of those issues is does parking charges come in at the same time? And clearly, we'll need to work with councils on that yeah. because all of the off-street car parks are controlled by councils. Right. We do the enforcement in those, so we'll be working very closely. Uh, but there is a decision to be made: is charging going to be introduced at the same time as? Parking enforcement is going to be introduced, and we, we haven't decided on that okay. as yet. Well, that's fair enough, and that's, I wasn't too sure. I wasn't clear whether that, as you said, it would be in the next few weeks you'll be bringing that, whether that will be announced straight away, or um, because I do know it is a concern because people are obviously trying to get back on their feet um, in terms of the local economy. So there's some consideration given that would be good. And we are keen to, whilst we're cautious about the number of people using buses, we are keen to promote. Uh, active travel Absolutely, as well, yeah. and mm-hmm. of course, making parking free tends to go against that. So there's, there's well, a lot of things. I, I'm, to be... I'm not, I'm not so much <coughs> suggesting that it's free, but uh, you know yes. what I mean. It's a very fine balance, but I just think it's something that we do. You know, we all, I suppose, right across the board in all departments, we need to be ensuring that we're, we're supporting each other. So it's just a consideration I think would be important to give. But thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks, thank you, Chair. Mrs. Kelly. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. <coughs> I just want to be clear. Um, the issue around not being able to spend capital is within the monitoring round, but not the large pot of money that's held at the centre. The minister is still awaiting a decision by the finance minister as to the success or otherwise of those bids. That would be the correct interpretation, I take it. Well, we, well, I mean, we've submitted our June monitoring bids, um, but we haven't submitted any capital bid as part of that because. It's, as we rehearsed earlier, mm-hmm. we think spending what we've got would be an achievement, and it would be. Yeah, I understand that, and, yeah. and that would be in line with the industry's thinking around the restrictions moving forward with COVID, would it? Well, I, I think it's because it, no one's been here before, and as Andy said earlier, it is much it's, it's much easier to lock down than to unlock. Coming I know. out of this difficult. is really difficult, but for the construction industry and others, in some cases, it'll be what it'll be. We will find out. I mean, we have proceeded on site with the neighbouring works for the hub in Belfast at the minute, and that can probably go not too badly because it's clearing up a site. If you're doing a, if you're building a building and people would normally be working close proximity, it, it's bound to have an impact on the speed of it as a social distancing. But we just have to see what happens because there's no, there's no history here, no memory. I need to. Yeah. You know, I and therefore, it. It, it, it'll be, but we will be doing our best. I mean, Andrew can talk about the work on his side. We're doing our <coughs> best, and people are getting on. I mean, because, and it, it is an issue. I think when we're recording this chair, in discussion about staff being not able to work, and that in your experience, in terms of our staff, our staff want to be able to work. Mm-hmm. They want to be able to work, <coughs> and we're getting frustrated early, early in this issue. You know, deskbound staff who were at home. We weren't able to, and they didn't have the IT kit. We're very frustrated because they had nothing to do. We've done superhuman efforts, and nearly everyone in that sort of role can work. Firms want to work. People want to get back to work. It's just how to do it safely. And, and I understand that, and, and I know that even as MLAs and trying to get our own offices up and established again, I mean, we have to look at our own risk assessments Absolutely. and what we need to do. So that's something that's exercising the minds of uh, myself and others as members of the Commission. Uh, and it is very important that you know we set the public sector sets an example in line with the health guidance restrictions. You know, in terms of the phased approach to return to work. So I'm very cognizant of uh, some of the limitations, if you like, that's uh, uh, on all of us uh, uh, in trying to get uh, everything moving again. Um, and, I, and can I just say, I, I did actually take the time to look to see if there was any guidance for taxi drivers, and I found it on the Department of Economies uh, website. But I understand. 
Uh, our own minister has made it very clear that we're very unique with having a land border uh, with the south of Ireland in terms of having uh, um, some sort of um, agreed policy in terms of public transport, particularly around buses and trains, which uh, if we are getting that economy moving again, the amount of cross-border travel is, is generally uh, huge, you know, and, and, and uh, it is something that we need to get right. Uh, so uh, I take it that the Minister is, t is doing as she said she is doing and trying to get a uniformity of approach and having uh, meetings with the Minister Ross in the South. Well, she is a uh, meeting, the Minister meets regularly both her counterparts um, in the UK and indeed spoke to Minister Ross last week about the issue of face coverings because obviously you need some consistency. If you get on the enterprise, you want some, you know, if you go on Belfast and had to wear face covering and you go on Dublin and don't, it'll be a bit of a nonsense. So you need some consistent approach, otherwise the operators are going to have real difficulty and the public will be confused. I think, uh, sorry, Chair, from what I've heard, even across in England, in the aftermath of uh, England making the decision, uh, there are concerns about who's going to police it and how is it going to be managed. Uh, well, that, that is an issue, and certainly, for example, in transit, and it's, they're trade unions are making it clear, you know, well, it's not their job to police any of this, particularly in terms of social distancing, which is quite right, because, I mean, in all of this, you've got to remember the welfare of the staff who are actually in the front line, mm -hmm. but it's not their job. So when they have difficulties, and such as the difficulties we had a couple of weeks ago in, in, in Helen's Bay, and, you know, people massing there, it's putting staff in a difficult position. But you're, you're quite right, the issue of who polices. And who sort of regulates? You know, I know. I know. There's an element of individual responsibility, but we see it already in our supermarkets. Some people shouting at others for not, you know, doing the, the six metre or whatever the two metre distance, and, and others stretching for the top of you. So I know we have an individual uh, responsibility, and I suppose there's some sort of self uh, community, um, um, if you like, peer pressure, you know, and others do, do it here. But can I ask Julia, just going back on the. Um, the, the, the driving examiner and the driving instructor, because I've, I've had received a lot of lobbying as well, and I understand people's concerns. So the driving instructor base is primarily a private sector, and they would be almost in the same sort of bailiwick as the taxi industry and taking advice from the uh, health and safety executive and making their own assessments and making their own decision. But driving examiners, can you say whether or not you, DVA are putting together a work resumption plan, and if so, when do you expect to have it before the minister? So uh, um, you're, you're absolutely right in your distinction between the, the, the two. Um, so, and we have, of course, been engaging with the instructor side of the business. People have been asking us, um, and there was communication issued last week, and we've we've um, you know committed to keep that channel of communication open. Uh, but ultimately, the advice will come from the likes of um, you know the the health and safety executive and the PHA about opening any business, um, and that's where they need to. All we're really doing is signposting. I guess, to those sorts of services and how to get financial support and, and all of those things. In terms then of the, our own uh, driving tests and the examiner role, uh, yes, we are looking at that and that's part of where we obviously will be engaging both with the Minister and with the staff and trade unions about it. Um, as I've already, uh, I think, explained, um, the driving test role is a particularly challenging one. So whilst we might be able to do things um, fairly quickly for motorcycles and buses. Once you get into the car scenario, that becomes a challenge, and we know that is creating difficulty for key workers. And you know, mm -hmm. there are a small number of people, certainly, um, who. Uh, and we've got those names. We know who they are. We, we, you know, we're ready to prioritise them. We've done all that piece of work as well, but we're just simply at that point where we can do it. And there's a lot of things that need to be brought into to play. But Minister would intend to be giving an update on all of the DVA services in the next few days because the 22nd of June is, is the date by which those services were to, to be effectively to be closed down until. So we're, we need to do an update. Uh, well, I think communication with the sector is particularly important, um, uh, yeah. Chair. Yes. You know, and uh, we all, as you can see, are, are getting lobbied. And it is quite right that people's concerns and are properly either signposted or allayed. I accept that. Okay, thank you, Miss Anderson. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, for your presentations here today. And uh, I just want to make a comment in the first instance because um, I'm very conscious of what you said, John, around ferries in the supply chain. There are almost um, 9,000 licensed taxi people uh, in the north. And 
quite clearly from the lobby and that I've been receiving, they feel abandoned by this department because their supply chain is their partner and maybe one child. There's 27,000 people that their supply chain, the food coming in on their tables. Um, is, is impacted by it. And whilst you may not have the fires uh, for the payment, the scheme uh, could have been devised with the two departments and handed over to, to the Minister of the Economy to implement. But the fact that the, even this department and every official, it's not just you officials that are here today, every, all the officials that have come in have all been like doing a points as pilot and abandoning uh, the taxi industry and the taxi drivers and they feel very sore about that, and so do we, I think, some of us anyway on this committee. Can I ask you, um, I was very disappointed to, uh, to see in this report um, around the flagship projects A5 and A6. I was surprised because I asked the Minister a question in the Assembly two weeks ago, and she would have had an opportunity to outline uh, what was potentially coming down the track with the delay, but instead she just answered me yes and stood down again with regards to her commitment. And I think that the, uh, the constituents around the area, I know that the MP, Orla Bailey, uh, was going to, she had hoped to talk to the minister today, but the minister had cancelled. And therein would have been an opportunity, I think, to get an understanding out to people about the report that has come through. They're saying it's in the report, uh, the information we have here, it's later than what was envisaged. So when, when was the inquiry report envisaged and why are we only being told now that this is going to have a knock-on effect one week after receiving notification from the Finance Committee that, or the Finance Minister that $9.2 million was being allocated uh, to the A5 for the stretch of the road uh, that, that we were quite interested on, uh, that would have led in from going from new buildings in Derry in Dishtaban. And now we hear that uh, this can has been kicked down the road because of obviously the report now not coming onto your desk and onto the Minister's desk later than once, what was envisaged. So, what was the expected time frame for the report? Um, when did you envisage it coming in? Well, I'd say something not, 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 not to Andrew a lot. First of all, it's important. When money was set aside in the budget, it was set aside just as estimates of spend subject to all the statutory approvals and all for, for example, the A5 to go ahead. And obviously, the public inquiry, of which I give evidence, um, the inspector will, de will determine when he submits his report. Um, the result of him coming in in September means that no matter what happens, it's unlikely there will be any construction spend this year. That's that's in one sense is disappointing, but it's just a fact of dealing with statutory processes. But I suspect Andy can probably amplify that. Yes, I mean the, the, the A five and A six different stages obviously the A five is still going Well the A six I was going to get on to you again because there's another six point eight yeah. million, two flagship projects, uh, two projects that are going to impact on my constituency and will impact in terms of the North West and both projects have had money returned, surrendered back to the financed, uh, finance minister, and we are in, in the city very concerned. He just received that news through this committee, through the notification that was given. Well, just to reassure you, there is an absolute commitment to both projects. And We're hearing that it, for a long time. It, but and in, the rela in relation to the A5, it has to go through the statutory procedures. When we give estimates for how long that will take, they are estimates because we don't know how long the inquiry will take. We don't know how much evidence is going to have to be considered by the inspector, and then we don't know how long the inspector is going to take to consider that evidence. But now, when we see the inspector, we're expecting his report in September. Officials then have to consider the findings of his report, and we have to make a recommendation to the minister before the minister decides what to do on that. That, unfortunately, is going to take us to the point where. We don't expect to be spending money on construction in this financial year. So what's, sort of the, what's the anticipated time frame for construction to start? We, uh, I think I, 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 would, I would rather wait until we got the inspector's report, because I, there are too many guessing points in that to give you an expected time. I don't expect it to be during this financial year, so I don't expect it, construction to be starting before uh, March. This, this, this year, or next year. That, that's extremely disappointing uh, to hear that, but it would be good to get even some kind of an indication 
uh, so that we can explain to constituents as to as to what is happen, uh, happening around that. The 7.2 million, I'm confused about that, because if we were informed last week that the Minister of Finance was given 9.2 million and there's 7.7 .7 million being surrendered, was that, is that nothing even to do with the 9.2 million? So that 9.2 million won't even have landed. The 7.7 .7 million is separate because there would be a, a, a gap of 1.2 million if that were that, if that was that money, so I'm wondering, is this 7.7 .7 million on top of the 9.2 that will not be coming to the department now because of this delay? Is that specific for the A5? Sorry. That, yes. Yes. That, that, that's that's simply because we had expected at one stage that construction would be able to start in in the current financial year, and we're now saying it can't. This is a, this is a scheme that when 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 construction. So the 9.2 million was additional to the 7.7 .7 million that was surrendered because last week we were informed. Orla Bagley, MP, received notification from the Finance Minister there was £9.2 million going to this department for the E5. Yes. For new buildings to, for, from new buildings to Strabane. So if that is £7.7 7 million, um, is that in addition to that £9.2 million that hasn't found its even way of landing in the department? No. Because this decision was no. taken? I'm not completely familiar with those figures, but... But I think what we're saying is we cannot spend that initial allocation, and we're declaring the seven odd million of that, that that's unspendable. And because it's a flagship project, we have to declare that we can't spend it elsewhere. Okay, the, but it's just, it would just be interested to to ascertain where the 1.2 million of the 9.2 that was allocated or stated from the finance minister would be given to the uh, to the minister of infrastructure. Yes, because, because we a gap we, in that. We, we will still be spending money on development of that scheme. There will be consultants working on that scheme, uh, and, and we will be agreeing target costs with contractors. Well, it, it, would be, it would be good to know what work is taking place, please. Yeah. So it would be good to get an update uh, so that we can inform people about what work is taking place. And this $6.8 million delay for the A6? The A6 delay is, is purely a COVID-19 issue. Uh, the construction industry virtually stopped whenever the lockdown commenced at the end of March. Uh, there was a period then when, well, they've been in recovery basically since then, and they have now got to a very good stage where they've got their PPE in place, they've got their safe systems of working in place, and they've got their staff in place. So most operations are continuing on the A6, and it's been, a, it's been quite a commendable effort by the contractor. Uh, there, there really is a can-do attitude being taken there. And uh, I, I wouldn't rule out, we're declaring surplus money now, I wouldn't rule out if, if the pandemic continues to uh, decline, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that we could be asking for extra money uh, later on in the year. But we, we, are, we are working on estimates, and it's estimates in areas where we have no previous experience. OK, well, let's, let's hope it does be accelerated. In relation to Brexit, uh, if I could go back to some of the comments that was made with regards to the 3.5 million uh, for preparation. I mean, I'm very conscious, as I'm sure everyone is, around the chemicals used to purify the water. Uh, are imported from the EU. So I'm asking in the context of a crash out Brexit because it's to understand the supply chain. You can't stockpile these chemicals. Some of them are quite volatile, uh, as we know. So there cannot be a stockpiling because they're just in time products, as we would know. So it's to get a further understanding about is it 3.5 million looking at. Um, how we use, for instance, the fact that, that there will not be a border in land, and you can, are you still able to utilise the the um, the EU to bring it in that way uh, across across Ireland rather than across the sea in the context of a crash out Brexit? And what work has been done by the minister? Uh, in, in the field of Brexit, given that, for instance, if you were to take that, because I was conscious of what you said about NI Water has, has bid for some of this money, if this is about water at a time when we could be going into the second wave of COVID, it's unthinkable what could happen to our hospitals, our schools, if they were up and running again, uh, let alone households and, and everything else. So I'm sure the, uh, the kind of risks, then the implications of those risks are something that the department has looked at, and it would be useful to get um, information about what this 3.5 million is, and if that's going to be enough. I guess that so the, the Brexit um, requirement is broken down into two bits. Part of it, 2.3 of it, is for NIW, and the other 1.3 is for internal staff costs uh, within the department that are, are already working away on Brexit-type issues. 
Um, a lot of your questions obviously and concerns are, are quite rightly around NIW and I would agree totally that we need to ensure that we have supply chains protected, that we understand those wh whichever direction they are coming from. Um, and there's going to have to be a lot of work around that, no matter what version of, of a Brexit mm -hmm. deal, and a lot of uncertainty, is, as you know, around that at, at this point. So, um, and we are also conscious that um, the, the COVID pandemic on top, and hence why um, NIW also has the COVID bid itself of 31.6 million on top, um, NIW needs to have security of funding to be able to do the work that it's that it's doing um, and that that applies now and it applies very much so as we head into the winter and they will have to take precautions and be careful about what it is that they're doing you're quite right some of those chemicals can't be stored for huge lengths of time they need to understand now a lot of good work as you know was done previously and some of that will will um, hopefully remain in play and actually has helped with some of the covid pandemic stuff as well to be honest as well but we we need to be sure that our water supply can't be protected um, and that NIW have the funding that it needs to be able to both process that water and also to process our wastewater. And at the moment, they, are, they, they fundamentally don't. Um, the COVID-19 pressure on its own at 31.6 million um, you know, is a significant scale of money. You put the Brexit on top. They have a rate uh, revaluation uh, problem um, and, and other pressures of another three million. The organisation needs considerable additional funding in order to be able to do uh, the work that it's doing. And yet, its staff are out there day and night at the moment and monitoring, particularly where there are, you know, problems in terms of. Um, the lack of rainfall and, and all of that, which has compounded the issues, and obviously then us needing, and back to Ms Kelly's point about us as communities uh, and as citizens, that we are using our water wisely and helping NIW as much as we possibly can not to overuse water um, when we're obviously stuck at, at home and, and doing what we're doing. So the Brexit, um, I think that the, the simple answer to your question is the Brexit pressure is complex, is very uncertain, but we just can't see how there won't be a pressure arising on NIW because you need to be absolutely sure that you can um, deliver a clean water supply to uh, across uh, the north. And, that's, and you can that's only, my, my understanding, Julie, you can only stockpile for a number of weeks. Exactly so right. given that there's no good Brexit, Given whatever the outcome of Brexit is, is going to have implications uh, across this island and especially for, for us here in the, in the north. And in the area of the supply chain, given that we've been told there's going to be no extension to the transition, they're not even going to ask for that, has the minister been able to furnish the other ministers around the executive table with the implications that Brexit is going to have in the context of a crash out or regardless of what happens on NI water? Because the minister herself, I know like ourselves, she's, she has agreed there should be an extension to the transition period. But I'm just wondering how other ministers, if they were furnished with this information, with the implications of NI water. Um, and Brexit's implications for it. So, I mean, ha has that as part? I know as part of the bid that that has gone in, but I'm wondering, does an explanatory note go with it? Uh, well, certainly, it's it's part of the of of the bid and, and dealing with the financial side. Uh, obviously, the executives then meeting on Brexit on, on an ongoing basis, and there's a broader question in that, I guess, about all of the of, of the Brexit um, area. Um, and as every department will do, this department will need to assess what the impacts are. There's an awful lot of uncertainty at the moment, and that's part of the difficulty in terms of, of looking ahead. Um, and we will be working, because of the criticality of water, we'll be working both north, south, east, west on all of that, and working very much with in tandem with other water companies to make sure, as we did the last time, to ensure that we understand the supply chains and where mutual aid could come in and, and things like that. Now, a lot of the detail of that is in play from, from, from previous time, but we will need to refresh that and mm -hmm. we will need to take in context um, the COVID um, pandemic. And I'm sure as as the Brexit discussions unfold and move forward, um, yes, our minister obviously has significant concerns about the amount of work that needs to be done uh, within the next few months. <coughs> Perhaps, Chair, we'll come back to that issue of maybe getting an update from officials um, on Brexit. Okay, thank you. But, Chair, I was just going to ask, is, that, is the Brexit subcommittee looking at the, these matters at the executive level? 
I would imagine it should be. The, the executive now sits as the executive to deal with Brexit. So the, there's not the a entire. subcommittee. There no, one there time was, was talk no, of a, it was, a, a special it's, committee. It's through a couple of committee, an ad hoc committee. No, they eventually worked out it was appropriate for the executive, and I think yep. as of so, this week, uh, when it meets on Mondays, the second half of the meeting is as the executive Brexit committee. Oh, and so the overall plan was ditched, really. Okay, the whole um, executive seems to be dealing with it. Wait, just finally, Julie, I, I've been contacted by some motorcycle in instructors, um, and I understand that there may be an issue in regard to the compulsory training um, certificates, CBT certificates. Yes. Um, and I know that they would normally have bought them in bulk, and they haven't been able to replenish those. Um, do you have an idea when that might be resolved? Yes, indeed, um, that one is as well. Anybody that has a problem with that, if they can contact DBA, we will be able to resolve that. We know we've been dealing with some in, in very recent times. It's, I think people were okay initially because they had their stocks and, mm -hmm. and whatever, but we've, we've been able to find a way of, of getting that through. We'll do it on an ad hoc basis as people require it, and then we'll be looking to you know, um, give more information out more generally about how that would be um, expanded and allowed to be done. It relies on the... Um, uh, the desks and the, and the centres are ever been open, so you have to find a different mm -hmm. way of doing it. It involves cash and stuff like that. But we are very, uh, very much open to if anybody has an ad hoc need and is urgently requiring stuff that we'll be able to, to get them sorted. Okay. And just finally, just in relation to the commentary around um, the reopening of MOT centres, and you referred to um, Newton Arts, Belfast, and others being COVID testing centres. Uh, and that may go on for some time. Is there any way that the and I, I don't know how they're currently operating, but is there any way that um, the, that you can work in partnership with it being still remaining um, partitioning off for COVID testing and also then continuing on MOTs? Or are we in a situation where those centres are essentially um, not going to be used? There's two different models at the moment. Um, so Belfast and Newtonards are um, with the two that were set up initially. They're run by the trusts, uh, Belfast Trust and by South Eastern Trusts and they operate through the test centre. Um, so the cars go in one end of the test centre and they go out the other end. So there's absolutely no way that those two centres could do uh, both MOT centre testing and uh, COVID-19 testing. The Craig Avon MOT centre is being used by, as a national test centre and it is completely different. It's a bit like the one at the SSE where it's in the it's basically in the outdoor area of the Craig Avon test centre with um, the, the tent type structures you would see at the SSE. Um, and we do think we can get a working model around that uh, in that they're in the outside area and they're not utilising the in, internal space that we need to do the MOTs. So the two are different, but Belfast and Newtonards could not be done as a double, and they are effectively going right the way through um, the test centre. Obviously, conscious that Newton Arts is probably your your busiest centre. The two are very busy. Very busy. Um, so it's really about and um, absolutely supportive of the of what we're doing in relation to um, COVID testing. But at the same time, it's about trying to to create that sort of balance, I guess, yeah. in service. It, it, is, it is very difficult. Um, our minister is absolutely committed to helping the health service uh, with, uh, with the COVID pandemic. Um, and the trusts, it, it works for the trusts. They're, they're exceptionally uh, happy with the arrangements there and that it's actually providing a very valuable service to them. But that's obviously something that would need to be um, considered more broadly. But minister is committed to assisting and doing all that she can to do that. Um, but within the Belfast and Greater Belfast area, those two centres um, are big um, and do take a lot of capacity. And is there an option to be able to move those tests outside um, in the in the area around those MOT centres, um, similar to what you have in Craig Avon? Um, I don't know whether that, that would be a matter, obviously, for the Department of Health um, and how they want to run those. We have certainly, obviously, touched base with them to to say, look, we are at a point whereby we're not far away from potentially wanting to um, look at those particular sites. Their advice back was that they are needing them for the foreseeable future. Now, we haven't got into a whole kind of um, discussion about what else could be done. It would certainly mean the current model would, would have to be changed completely from what they're currently doing. Right. But in the not-too-distant future, you will be having that conversation? Well, we need to understand exactly what their requirements are.
Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for for your time this morning. It's very unusual the fact that we've had we have three um, deputy secretaries with us, and I suppose in some ways a number of us veered off. Um, I suppose the, the main issue around the monitoring round. But thank you very much for, for your time thank and, you, um, and and taking our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, just in, in light of that, do we have recommendations in relation to where we go? I know, obviously, we require some clarity in relation to the A5 project, um, so we may want to follow up on that, and obviously we will have Brexit briefings um, yes, about that. at some stage I think, in the next, um, probably the next edition of the uh, Forward Work Programme. Yep. Mr. Muir. Yeah, I think you touched upon it in terms of the statement which was made today and getting some sort of a, a well, actually, more of a detailed breakdown and, and a briefing from the Minister. I also would declare from the record my stepfather is the quality manager on the A6 a project. So <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't go too hard at me. Um, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I suppose the, the early indications, I suppose, in relation to our forward work programme, so that first week in July was, was indicated as summer recess, and I understand that the business committee maybe aren't meeting until this, are still meeting on the 7th, so there'll probably be an, there'll be an expectation probably of a meeting on that on the 8th, so we may look to maybe have the Minister at that stage. Mm. That's, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Um, yeah. And then we move into summer recess. Correspondence. Okay. <laughs> Moving then to um, correspondence. So just draw your attention to the memo at page 136 and also um, obviously table correspondence, which we have received. Um, members may have comments that they want to make with regards to the correspondence, certainly at page 298, we have received a response from the Minister of Finance with regards to flexibilities around the job retention scheme, which we had raised on behalf of the haulage industry. Um, if members are content, perhaps we, we should forward this correspondence through to both RTA and RHA, yep. yeah. given that um, they, they had raised it with us. Okay. Members, any other comments on the correspondence? Or are you happy to... Um, go with the suggested actions. Great, Great. Okay, thank you. Um, Forward work programme, as we've mentioned, is um, at page 307. Um, I also been in con um, London. London Airport had been in contact with me, um, and perhaps with others, um, and I'd spoken to the clerk about scheduling a meeting with all of the ports um, and staff have been in contact with them and we're going to try to arrange good idea. Um, them to come to see us because obviously at this stage we would have had visits perhaps to Warren Point um, and Lorne. Um, mm -hmm. So if members are content with that. Yeah, okay. good idea. Okay, thank you. Um, any other business? Just, just one thing, Chair. Um, there's engagement with the, some of the ferry companies in recent times and the, you know, the package of support that was announced I think the understanding is the amount of money that was um, announced then hasn't flowed through to the companies, and that's had an impact in terms of the slots available for the uh, hauliers and stuff like that. So maybe it's just getting some correspondence to the department about whereabouts that package is. Um, obviously, it runs to the end of June, so whether there's any continuation of it as well. Okay, that may have to go to Department of Finance. Finance, so we could. Well, it was, yeah, um, so it was. It was, was DFT it and DFI and together, you know, so, so perhaps we could send correspondence to three. Yeah. Let's see what that is. And someone will pick I it up. The problem is, yeah. They said it was to secure the ferry. Okay. Money Any other comments anyone wishes to make at this stage? No, thank you. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, Ms. Anderson. Uh, um, I just want to make a comment around the Delrada, uh, Delrada contract. Uh, there were some reports yesterday in the in the newspaper that um, that the, there are s per perhaps a potential conflict of interest uh, by the, those that worked with the company also involved in doing work for the department in assessing this project. So I just would like uh, was this, to was this in relation to Dalradian? Yeah. So there was it was reported yesterday in the paper. That there is a there's a, a firm that worked very closely 
uh, with the, the mining company also being uh, contracted out by the department to carry out work on the given project. So I just think that there would be concerns that there could be a conflict of interest there. Okay, well, we could write to the minister just. Um, if we say the yeah, article. It would be helpful if you want to see, see if you want to have a look yeah, at yeah, the, yeah, it was reported yeah, yesterday. Yeah, the yeah, article yeah, and perhaps yeah, ask yeah, yeah. the paper. Um, some clarity in regards to that or comment has been drawn to the attention of the committee and just ask for some commentary from the department. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. The next meeting will take place in this room on the 17th of June at 10 a.m. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.